This is not a time to lock down on everything you got, giving of your love, giving of your heart, giving of your health, giving of your money. This is a time, this is a time to share what God has given to you. You want to get out of this place that we're in? You want to see God's Spirit fall in a wonderful way? Then you need to lean into the generosity of the heart of God. God so loved the world that He gave. We got to learn to start giving again. The principle of faithfulness and consistency you'll find out of Luke 1. Out of Luke 1, you find Zacharias, the uh, to be father of John the Baptist, and he's a priest in the temple. And every day he had to go up and go to the temple. He worked in the temple, and this is how the King James put it in the course of time, in the course of his workload. He showed up at the temple, and when he did, there was an angel waiting on him at the temple and spoke to him and talked to him about John the Baptist, the forerunner of Jesus, who were to come, and that his wife, who was barren, was going to have this John the Baptist baby. Now, you're thinking, what kind of principle can get out of that? It was just another Monday morning, and I'm sure that Zacharias didn't feel led or anointed to go down to the temple because there was not much going on there, but a little water sprinkling, no revival. There was no worship team. There was no uh, you know, dancing. There was no singing. There was no great seminar. It's just like he just showed up for work. Oh, you're going to hate this one. He just showed up and was faithful and consistent in the assignment that God had given him without any sense of being, any sense of destiny, any sense of anointing. He was just faithful to do what God had told him to do. He just showed up. And I know that many of you now want to stop. You want to quit. It's like, Lord, I'm not doing that anymore. I pastor a church now, and I'm going to write a new book called I Quit Again Again. And the next, the sequel is, I ain't doing it no more, no more. <laughs> well, he must be annoying. No, no, it's just my job. That's what I do. People depend on that. You have to show up. And you know what? You keep showing up long enough, God's going to be curious about what you're doing and show up with you. <laughs> the revelation you're waiting for is at the place of the assignment God has given you that you have the faithfulness, consistent things that get there, whether you feel like it or not. God's not coming to you. You're going to your place of excitement out of faithfulness to do the work that God has given you to do, whether it feels great or not, or whether it's, whether it's you're famous or not. And by the way, being famous is overrated. Just want to let you know. He wasn't famous. He just showed up for work. How about this one? I'll end with this one. Didymus and John 21, Thomas. Jesus shows up, remember Jesus, he's resurrected Christ now, and he shows up in the room the first time where the disciples were gathered. First time to visit them after his death and resurrection. But Thomas was out there, he shows up in the room, he just like, just, just, I love this, when Jesus just, he just appears, like poof, he's in the room. Yeah, he doesn't use a door because he is the door. If you've noticed that. He just appears in the room, and he looks around. This is just my interpretation of what's going on. This is a 99% that may not be theologically uh, balanced. I'm just saying. He's in the room, and he just breathes on them, and they receive some Holy Spirit. You think, what was that all about? But it said, but Didymus was not there. Didymus Thomas was unbelieving. He didn't believe any of the stuff that's going on. He is totally beside himself because the Lord had abandoned them. He's at the, it's like he, he doesn't believe anymore. He is the poster child for unbelief. But Jesus comes back for the second time. The first time he did something. It was, it was notable. It was good. He breathed upon him, said, receive the Holy Spirit. It's like, okay, you know, we got that. Catch the Spirit. We got it. Then he shows up the second time and Dennis was there and the first thing he does, he doesn't even address the disciples. He looks right at Doubting Thomas. He looks right at Didymus and he walks up and he said, hey, put your fingers in my hands. And, put your, I, and this is what Didymus did. And he said, my Lord and my God, and get this, and then many miracles did he in their presence which you're not able to write into this book. The bottom line is, God is the God of the gathering. 
Even if you're an unbelieving Didymus, God's waiting on you to reveal what he wants to do because he's the God of all of his family being in this place at one time. Oh, you didn't get that. God is waiting not just on the famous and the mighty and, and the spiritual and all the stuff that we all are. He's not just waiting on that. He's waiting for the Didymus. God will not reveal what he's about to reveal until the principle of, 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 of at least faithfulness, that Didymus at least showed up. An unbelieving disciple still decide to show up. You can show up even in your unbelief. If you'll just show up, God might do something. Number three, Luke 18, the principle of begging. I'm well acquainted with that one. We call it, where I come from, annoying. But listen, being annoying can help. If you're married, you know what I mean. Or if you have children, you know what I mean. A good scripture for it was when uh, Jesus talked about this woman who was pleading with the judge. And this judge is a very austere judge. This judge is not very lenient. But this woman is not kind. But this woman keeps aggravating him. And she's pleading with him. He said, and he gave her what she wanted because of her importunity. The word importunity there is relentless aggravation. I told you, we're going to go off the rails here. I am not afraid to beg anymore. I am not afraid to annoy the Lord. I've learned to swallow my darn pride a long time ago. If begging will help, I'm in. And I annoy Jesus every night, especially the last few years. I annoy him every night. I go, knock, knock. He goes, who's there? I go, Larry. And he goes, who? Larry, me? And I, Lord, would you please... I mean, that's my prayer. I mean, I, all I do every night is just annoy the Lord. I said, if I aggravate Jesus long enough, he's going he's gonna to give me what I, I got grandkids, and I know what he's going to do. He's going to give me what I want, whether it makes me sick or not. <laughs> Mark 7 says that a woman's was, son was healed because... The mother was begging, pleading, pleading, and annoying. So the principle of annoyance, I don't know if it's working, but I'm going to find out. I'm just being honest with you. I'm telling you what, I don't know much anymore. The older I get, the further away I realize I have been from heaven. And I'm starting to figure it out. I got a little time left here. I got to make some noise, let them, let them know something's going on with me here. And if I have to annoy the Lord, I have a grandson named Cody. Uh, he came to my house. My daughter dropped him off some years ago. Cody has allergies and to certain fruits, but he likes grapes. So the first thing he started to do when he gets there, because, you know, mother, his mother wouldn't let him have grapes, but his granddad would. And you know, the, yeah. <laughs> you know why grandkids and grandparents get along so well? They both have a common phenomenon. <laughs> They both have a common enemy. <laughs> so he's there with me. And he said, Grandpa wants some grapes. And I'm thinking, you're not supposed to have that. But he starts annoying me. He starts bothering me. He said, Grandpa, I, I, I was in great. Yeah, Mama won't let me have grapes. And I'd just gone to the grocery store and I'd bought like 400 pounds of grapes. I like grapes too, green grapes. And I just opened the fridge door and said, knock yourself out, Code. I don't know how much he ate, I didn't want to look, but I was done with him annoying me. 
Steph comes and picks him up. She calls four hours later. She says, Dad, something's wrong with uh, Cody. I go, really? <laughs> she was like, he's throwing up green stuff everywhere. I must be a demon. She goes, actually, it looks like grapes pushed mushed together. I go, I have no idea. She said, Dad, did you feed him grapes? I said, yes, I did. She said, why? I said, because he wanted them and he wouldn't shut up. We're the children of God. I'm not afraid. He's my father. If I aggravate him long enough, he's going to say, well, some, but Michael, shut him up and give him what he wants. Yeah, I don't know. It's like, I am not afraid to annoy God. So in this time that we're in, it's time to start stating your case. Oh my God, that didn't go over well. <laughs> Number four, principle of generosity. Listen, goes a long way. Both generous with your money, generous with your time, generous with who you are, generosity. We need to understand and learn the principle of generosity to be able to transition into this new place that God is bringing us to. Let me give you a good scripture for that in Acts 10 with Cornelius. Let me tell you about Cornelius. Cornelius was a, a centurion of the Italian regiment sent down from Rome uh, to occupy, to help occupy Israel at the time. And Peter, the apostle at the same time, was in church planning mode, and he was going through uh, the, the area, planting churches uh, 50 or 60 miles south of where uh, Cornelius was at. And um, <clears throat> while he's there, he has a vision of a sheep dropping down and animals in the sheep. And the Lord says, arise and eat. He said, I'll never eat anything clean. And you know the interpretation. He was saying, I'm about to give you and about to give the Gentiles who you've considered unclean uh, a passage of interest into the Holy Spirit and the things of God. Well, how's that going to happen? At the same moment, I love the anatomy of a defining moment. In defining moments, things happen without the dots being connected on earth and heaven is planned. So Cornelius is his house and an angel appears to Cornelius about the same time Peter's praying on a rooftop. And his angel appears to Cornelius and he says to Cornelius, uh, because the Lord has seen your alms and your heart and your giving to the poor, he's going to do something with you. He said, send your man down to a, and Joppa to a place there. There's a man named Peter and tell him to come here and you know the story. They go get Peter. Peter's on the rooftop, doesn't know what's going on. No, no, this, this is strictly a Jewish thing that's happened, the Jewish church, the first century church, with the expectation of it bleeding over into uh, Gentile masses, according to the prophets, what was written, but it hadn't quite happened yet. That tipping point was not there. What would cause that tipping point? Well, there's a man up there called Cornelius who doesn't know the Lord, who just loves people, and he's generous, and he's generous to people. And the angel said, because of your generosity, I'm gonna do something major, major global shifting with you. And Peter gets there and Peter prophesies over him and Peter preaches to him and leads them and they all speak with tongues of Gentile, uh, the Gentiles and they were baptized in water and they were the first Gentile Christians and then Cornelius goes back to Rome and takes it to Rome and then to Europe and, and then to uh, England and then to America and 2,000 years later, we're the grandchildren of Cornelius. The Gentiles got jump-started by a gift of generosity, the spirit of generosity out of a Roman name, Cornelius. I'm telling you what, being generous is an important thing. Generosity will shift the atmosphere. Generosity will shift destinies. Generosity will place you in a place for God to do something extraordinary for you because God is a giver and he loves people that give and he rewards them expeditionally. So my suggestion, I forgot my suggestion, is to stop being a tightwad. This is not a time to lock down on everything you got, giving of your love, giving of your heart, giving of your health, giving of your money. This is a time, this is a time to share what God has given to you. You want to get out of this place that we're in? You want to see God's spirit fall in a wonderful way? Then you need to lean into the generosity of the heart of God. God so loved the world that he gave. We got to learn to start giving again.